This presentation is part of UCL's Bachelor of Arts and Sciences module, Approaches to Knowledge. Rather than being a formal lecture, it's a brief presentation to give students on the course some idea of the sort of facts that they might want to find out about someone that they consider to be significant in the formation of their own discipline. They might consider someone significant because they're a particular hero of theirs. Or they might want to talk about someone that they feel was, has been ignored by the history of their discipline. Over the next couple of weeks, we're considering in detail what makes a discipline. And it seems quite valid to think about the individuals who've contributed to the disciplines in which we're choosing to work or study. I've been a lifelong cataloguer and now I'm a lecturer in Library and Information Studies. One of the areas that I research and publish on is, of course, cataloguing. Today I'm going to give a very short presentation on someone that I consider to be really significant in the field. Not necessarily because he's a hero of mine, but because although he was working in the middle of the 19th century, his thoughts, opinions and theories still influence what we do today on a day-to-day -day basis as catalogers, and he's had a profound effect on cataloguing theorists in the 20th and now into the 21st centuries. First of all, a little bit of background to let you understand something about the world in which Cutter was working. This is a photograph from a New York library in the 19th century, but of course libraries have been around for a very long time before that. No doubt you'll all have heard of the Library of Alexandria, which in classical times aimed to collect a copy of every published work then in existence. However, the 19th century is very significant to librarianship as a discipline. Indeed, it was in the late 19th century that librarianship became a degreed profession and the normal route changed from being working in a library and gaining experience on the job to being educated at a university. Cataloguing has been considered as central to librarianship as a discipline and in the 19th century we saw a growth in people trying to create catalogue rules to ensure consistency. Here, one of Cutter's contemporaries, Charles Jewett of the Smithsonian Library, is writing about the importance of uniformity. He says that it's imperative. However, among many labourers, uniformity can only be secured by the adherence of all to rules, embracing, as far as possible, all details of the work. As librarianship moved towards recognition as a discipline within the university academy, there was a drive towards sharing the rules, sharing standards and documenting how things should be done. It probably sounds quite easy to people who have never catalogued anything to create a catalogue record. So I'll give you three very simple examples of the challenges that we face even in the present day. Here's an absolutely classic example of a problem with the title. We've all heard of the Pickwick Papers by Charles Dickens, but the title originally was the Posthumous Papers of the Pickwick Club. And if you run a search on a catalogue for the Pickwick Papers, the Posthumous Papers of the Pickwick Club are unlikely to show up. Cataloguing rules provide us with simple solutions to deal with this problem and ensure that when our users search, they find both the older editions catalogued under the full title and the more modern editions catalogued under the more shorthand name. Here's another common problem. Sometimes writers will choose to write in two different genres, as we can see here with Agatha Christie, who also wrote under the pseudonym Mary Westmacott. Seems quite natural for publishers at some point to want to cash in in her fame as Agatha Christie and to want to boost the sales of Mary Westmacott novels. And we can see this happening in the image on the far right. Cataloguing rules provide us as libraries with routes to ensure that, that users searching for Agatha Christie murder novels find only the murder novels. That people interested only in Mary Westmacott find Mary Westmacott. 
but that those who have an interest in Agatha Christie as a person, perhaps they're interested in her as a writer and want to see her complete oeuvre, can actually find all of the works. And then, of course, there are times when people, authors and the subjects of books, decide to change their names, most commonly when they get married. But I'm sure you can all remember when Prince decided to change his name to a squiggle that in an interview even he said he wasn't sure how to pronounce. And it took some time before we all decided that he would actually be referred to as the artist formerly known as Prince. When he got married, he decided to change his name back to Prince and library catalogues had to cope with all of these name changes to ensure that anybody who wanted to listen to his music, watch his films or read books about him could actually find everything that they wanted. Anyway, in the 19th century, as Catherine Mintis put it, we saw a multiplication of the librarian's duties and responsibilities, which meant that the office was no longer and could no longer be treated as a sinecure. We saw a professionalisation of the role of librarian, and as I said earlier, we saw it become a university subject. As part of the growth in librarianship, we saw a multiplication of cataloguing rules to the point that it could all become a bit confusing. Here's an extract from Mr Panizzi's rules, the rules for the catalogue at the British Museum, which he had been charged with rationalising. He managed to get them down to 91 rules, and if you look closely at them if you're interested, you'll see that some of those are very, very specific indeed. In 1876, the United States Bureau of Education published a report on the state of American librarianship at the time. As part of that report, they published Cutter's Objects, Means and Reasons for Choice. Instead of lots of specific rules for lots of specific occasions, Cutter advocated clear principles. The modern-day commentator William Denton has described Cutter's objects as, quotes, the first set of axioms made in cataloguing, and he defines an axiom as a core set of simple, fundamental principles that form the basis for complete cataloguing codes. Cutter's objects, means, and especially his reasons for choice, put the library user right at the centre of cataloguing. The catalogue record did not exist as a thing of beauty in its own right, but as a tool that users should be able to predict easily how to search. And these principles and the centrality of the user have been carried forward through every other cataloguing code. The most recent, the Anglo-American cataloguing rules, which have just now been superseded by their new version, Resource Description and Access, derive their methods, their means and their centrality of the user from the ideas that Cutter advocated in the 19th century. At an international level, Cutter's ideas have influenced the International Statement of Cataloguing Principles in 2009 and, more significantly perhaps, he influenced functional requirements for bibliographic records, the set of principles that have informed the design of catalogues for the 21st century, so that now we can link data field by field rather than record by record, but we're governed by what Ferber calls the user tasks. In Ferber speak, that's using the data to find materials that correspond to the user's stated search criteria using the data retrieved to identify an entity, using the data to select an entity that is appropriate to the user's need, and using the data in order to acquire or obtain access to the entity described. Hard not to remember Cutter's objects, to enable a person to find a book, to show what the library has, and to assist in the choice of a book. Of course, in his day, Obtaining access was as simple as walking to the library shelves and pulling the book down. Amazing that someone who worked in that environment should have such a strong influence 
in our more complex systems networked world.